Hello, it's Cry here with a part 2 for my talisman explanations with the tier list. Because I think a tier list is quite fair for something like the talismans that have less nuances than weapons. They are more easily comparable to each other for performance, and we're going to be comparing them in order to maximize the amount of power you're getting from the 4 talisman slots. Sorry this took longer than expected because I had to redo all the slides after seeing the feedback that using the base image on FextraWiki is confusing when I'm talking about the max level upgraded versions. I always use the max versions for calculations even in my part 1 video and for this video as well. This list will be split into PvE and PvP because not only do some talismans have different stats for PvE and PvP, there are other reasons why a talisman is more preferred in PvP versus PvE and vice versa. Once again, I will skip power creep charms like the arsenal charm because the great jar's arsenal is a strictly better version. And I will not be covering these utility based charms in the tier list either. Okay, two things I want to clear up. This section in part 1 of my video is meant to be a bit of a satire. Moon of Noxella is obviously not completely useless. It gives you the option to become an absolute unit of a spell overlord, but my honest suggestion is to become better at doing something you can already do, rather than having an even wider variety when it comes to optimizing. 10 spell slots is more than enough. If you need an example on how to do more with less, you can always refer to my Night Wielder build for both PvE and PvP. As for the long tail cat talisman, yes, I realize there is a 4 meter gap where you take fall damage without dying. Again, it was meant to be something funny. I'm sorry, adding something like that in a serious video probably made some of you think I wasn't joking. Alright, let's get started. First up, this is going to be what the tier list looks like. Where is the S tier you might ask? Well, the tier system is arbitrary. What matters is the relative strength. But these days, people like to use S tier or even SS tier. As for me, I like to reserve S tier for something truly overpowered enough that it deserves a nerf. For talismans, I think they are very powerful candidates. But rather than them needing nerfs, it's usually other talismans that are quite weak in comparison and need buffs. Other than that, we should also establish the rules behind the tier list. Otherwise, we wouldn't be thinking on the same page. Talismans are compared to alternatives within each category for PvE and PvP. PvE-wise, I take into account both general exploration and bosses. While PvP-wise, I take into account both duels and invasions. Some criteria for the ranking. The list will be centered on endgame level, which I will call 125 to 150, for the sake of getting the numbers right for PvP as well. I will talk about how level affects this list at the end too, so don't worry about it. Secondly, the list will take into account the universality of each talisman. Something like the Drake talisman will lose points because of how specific their function is. They will, under the right circumstances, be more effective than the list suggests, but the list covers their overall performance if you just have them equipped. And then there's overall activation, which includes ease of activation and activation uptime. Ease of activation is simple. How easy is it to activate the condition for the effect? For example, the heirloom talismans require no additional restrictions to give you 5 stat points whereas this magic scorpion charm only works on magic attacks. This happens in the crafting phase of your build. And then we have the ritual sword talisman, which is even harder to activate because it requires you to stay at 100% HP. As for the activation uptime, it means how often you can make use of the talisman. This part is a bit like universality. For example, if you're playing a pure sorcery build, you'll be pretty much getting 100% uptime for the graven mass talisman. This, once again happens in the crafting phase of your build. As for the Lord of Blood's Exaltation, it requires you to apply bleed to yourself or your enemies. While this is easy to do, I wouldn't expect 100% uptime, especially in PvP. And something else like the Curved Sword Talisman will also not have 100% uptime by the nature of the game itself. First, you might want to do moves outside guard counters, like your weapon art. While your entire strategy can be based on just guard countering after an attack, guard counters do quite the stagger. Unless you're going to be staring at the boss without doing a critical hit when they're down, your critical strike will not benefit from curved sword talisman either. Finally, I forgot to mention this in part 1, but I am talking about these talismans assuming no hard swaps, which is opening up your inventory to do talisman swaps mid-combat. 
I will, however, add a hard swap section near the end of the video to add in further caveats. Now let's finally get to the tier list. I will be doing them in the same order as part 1 of my talisman video. If you haven't seen it, you probably want to refer to it for some math. I will be adding more here though. It wouldn't be a bad idea to have both of them opened if you're doing a very detailed study. With all that out of the way, let's finally get started. The consumable talismans aren't too impressive overall. For the perfumer's talisman, I mentioned in part 1, it only works on damage-based perfume items. Therefore, it works on the spark aromatic and the perfumer's bolt. It does indeed stack multiplicatively with the arrow sting talisman for the perfumer's bolt, making it stronger than explosive bolts with just arrow sting talisman. The Fextra wiki has the talisman at 15% effectiveness, which is incorrect. While I like the wiki, I don't really use Fextra for data because I often find mistakes there. Just a heads up in case you're wondering why my numbers are different, and I know the site is way more popular than my channel. As for the companion jar talisman, you can probably find a lot of videos on insane jar damage with the jar head, which gives you another 15% damage boost to crack and ritual pots. I think the jar talisman is a bit more useful overall. These talismans enable a different type of playstyle, but I wouldn't generally recommend either of them. The bow talismans are quite a necessity for bow builds, especially in PvE. The arrow's reach talisman also prevents damage drop off of arrows at longer distances. At shorter or medium distance, you don't get much of a drop off if any at all. Therefore, for bosses that stick closer or in a PvP setting where enemies are chasing you, the arrow's reach doesn't do much. But for general PvE setting, it can greatly help at longer distances. The arrow sting talisman gets a much reduced rating in PvP because of the viability of pure bow builds at higher level PvP. Now you might say, well, A tier for PvE, is that so, Kreitz? First, for the arrow's reach, people play pure bow builds often to snipe at a range. And as mentioned in part 1, it does enable some wacky sorcery builds, which is much less relevant in PvP. Secondly, if you're doing pure bow, arrow sting talisman is actually very powerful, comparatively speaking, which is what tier lists are meant to do. Compare this to the Graven Mass Talisman, and you'll see it gives a bigger boost while weighing less. This will be clearer as we fill in more talismans in the list. Next, we have specific attack types, starting with the Godfrey icon. A fully charged spell or weapon art build is much more doable in PvE than PvP, but even then, I find it hard to say you'll be focused on charged attacks over two thirds of the time, especially when sometimes you just have to dodge or the enemy has low HP anyway. In PvP, it's barely usable for some charged spell or weapon art build, like if you really want to style in more casual battles or invasions, and not a strategy you focus on. Next is the Axe Talisman that is quite crap in general, since you're only getting a measly 10% boost to charge heavy attacks and not regular heavy attacks. In PvE, you can abuse this with heavy attacks that do multiple hits like Short Spear. While in PvP, something like the Urumi can still enable this Talisman, but its uses are few. For the Curved Sword Talisman, I think it's very powerful in PvE, because relying heavily on guard counters in PvE isn't a bad strategy. Blocking in PvE tends to make Elden Ring much easier, as you can learn the boss's moves without getting punished hard while failing a dodge. You can use guard counters with a relatively high uptime if you just turtle and wait for the opportunity to strike back. Guard counters also have high poise damage, enabling critical hits. Since it is a large 20% boost, even after factoring the times you don't use card counters, I'd say it qualifies in A tier as long as this is your main strategy. In PvP though, card counters are super obvious. You might land this on a newbie, but it doesn't make the talisman good. The claw talisman is very strong, since jump attacks are powerful, especially when power stancing weapons with jump attacks that hit together. It also enables a playstyle for a lot of the less meta weapons, while still comboing well with good weapon combinations like power stanced straight swords. If two thirds of your moves are based on jump attacks, you can easily get a 10% bonus from this talisman. By the way, this doesn't work on bow jump shots. The hammer talisman is effective against blockers indeed, but they are not that common in PvE. Because of that, its rating suffers greatly. In PvP, if you're fighting a great shield player, your HP won't usually last long enough to destroy their OP strategy.
and enemies have to be blocking with a shield to begin with, not using one to parry. This talisman is one that suffers greatly from the lack of universality. Lance talisman is decent in overworld if you like mounted combat, but it suffers from not being universally usable because you can't do many dungeons and bosses with mounts. Mounts aren't available in PvP, so the PvP side is self-explanatory. Twinblade Talisman only works for the final attack of light attack chains, and since even the shortest light attack chain is 3 hits, while you're backloading your attack into a hit you might never do because the enemy already moved away, I think it's completely garbage. This should be way more than 20%. The Spirit Talisman is kinda meh in PvE because oftentimes you're just attacking, not aiming for counter attacks. It's really powerful in PvP though, with the poking meta. The math for this talisman is in part 1, and just as a reminder, it only works for the physical portion of your attack. And yes, it does work for bows. Ah, the great shield talisman. I rated this a bit lower in PvP than PvE, because oftentimes the great shield itself is actually enough already. What you really have to watch out is how you manage your stamina. The talisman saves you a bit of stamina, but it doesn't completely negate stamina drain now with the 1.04 nerf. The spell related talismans that buff magic damage of either incantations or sorceries are easy to place. This will be even more evident when I explain the values near the end of the video. You can sort of see their relationship versus arrow sling talisman, which isn't as constant. I personally think pure sorcery or incantation builds are more viable in PvP than pure bow builds, so they didn't get the PvP viability nerf and their values basically remained constant. Radagon Icon's 30v dex gives you a significant boost in spellcasting speed. This is hard to pinpoint in a general basis. I'll try to cover casting speed in the future because it'll take an entire video, but I suggest trying this with spells you're using because they differ. Old Lord's Talisman is more of a utility based talisman, but the extended duration on buffs is not only extra FP saved, it also means less vulnerable time for casting. While in duels, It'll be dependent on whether your enemy lets you buff up at the start. In invasions, it can be very valuable additional time while 3 players are chasing you and you don't have time for more buffs. I've already said this twice, but I think the primal glintstone blade is crap, without hard swaps at least. But I see some of you want additional evidence, so here's the math for primal glintstone blade. I believe FP is only really an issue at lower levels when your max FP is lower than the amount of FP recovered from your flask. If you have a max level flask and still struggle with FP cost, you are probably either using Lusats, which you can just drop for Karen Regal, being inefficient with spells like killing a little soldier with Renala's full moon that costs 55 FP, or your build is probably not optimized well, so you're struggling. The main issue with Primal Glintstone Blade is the HP loss. For those 20 Vigor Giga Chats that die many times a region, at this point, I think it's pointless to convince you Vigor is great. If you think you'll never get hit, so be it. Just use this talisman. But for the rest of you, assuming you have something close to the vigor soft cap, like 50 or 60 vigor, we subtract 15% of our HP with higher vigor plus primal blade and find the vigor where we can get an equivalent amount of HP without the talisman. This is what we get. We can see 15% HP is 10 points of vigor loss at 50 vigor and 13 points of vigor loss at 60 vigor. Let's just use 10 points of vigor loss and place that vigor into mind. Here are some FP values for mind. These are some comparisons with 10 point mind difference. 40 mind actually exceeds 220 FP, the FP regeneration from a plus 12 flask. But you don't usually drink your FP flask when your FP is perfectly empty. And if you really want to, you can scale it down a bit. So let's just say you basically gain around 33% more FP from the additional mind. 25% less FP used is essentially 33% more FP. So even at 30 to 40 mind jump, you're pretty much breaking even. This means that you can basically get the same amount of effect this talisman gives you by redistributing your stats without wasting a talisman slot. Furthermore, if you somehow still need more FP, the Cerulean Seed Talisman increases your flask recovery by a whole 20%, and even that is already excessive in my opinion. The Primal Glintstone Blade is basically just for you when you want to be fancy at super high levels of FP. Even then, the higher your vigor is, the worse the talisman gets 
This is the reason why I rate this talisman as F tiered without heart swaps. Crucible not talisman goes to F, unless someone finds me use for this talisman without it being super niche. I place the Crucible Feather Talisman at C tier. I don't think the trade off is particularly that great, and I think this is one of the harder talismans to pinpoint. Someone might make better use out of this talisman, so it's kind of a placeholder for me. I've tried it, but I don't really run this talisman personally. The Bull Ghost Talisman is C tiered in PvE because it can still prevent you from getting staggered, allowing you for trades. I've tested high poise versus slow poise in PvE, and I can say it does indeed allow you to trade through some stuff, but it isn't that important because you typically just want to dodge. As for PvP, it allows you to reach points you can't typically reach, like 101 points, for you to ignore moves like Storm Stomp. It also works well with weapons that grant hyper armor by increasing your hyper armor by 33% too. I give it an A tier easily, but it isn't an all powerful talisman. If your original points is not high enough, it doesn't help you by much. If it doesn't push you through certain breakpoints you care about, it also doesn't do much for the most part. Furthermore, if you have something like 50 points, it's more efficient to just increase your equip load and wear heavier armor if fashion isn't your concern. If fashion is, then well, even if it's less effective, Bullgolds will still get the job done. The critical related talismans are very good in PvE in general, and not so much in PvP. The two assassin staggers offer critical base builds and an insane amount of sustain. This allows you to constantly heal up and replenish your FP for more weapon arts to stagger your enemy. They both work towards saving a ton of flasks, and allows you to make much more mistakes. On the other hand, since you rarely land a critical hit in PvP, and when you do, you typically either win or nearly win, they're rated F tier. No point of overkilling your enemies, it's better to build for cases where you're the one struggling. This is also why the Dagger Talisman is F tiered in PvP, while B tiered in PvE. It does not make A tier in PvE, because for bosses, you are probably spending half your damage on staggering the boss before the critical strike. Therefore, you're not getting the full 17% of the effectiveness. It's more like half of that. As for the Crucible Scale Talisman, I'm gonna be frankly honest. I've gotten critically struck by PvE enemies precisely once. The NPC Knight in Rhea Lucaria Academy parried me and one-shotted me the first time I went there. I'm not sure the talisman would have saved me, but besides that, I don't recall having been critically struck again. Perhaps there is a boss this can help you with, but because such occasion is definitely a rarity, it gets a F tier. As for PvP, it managed to squeeze out a D tier for me, since I know some people spam moves, especially weapon arts, that can be easy to parry. It can act as a preventive measure from getting one-shotted, allowing you to make a comeback. But overall, you should just try to avoid getting critically struck. The status effect talismans are super powerful. They definitely go into the A tier for PvE. There's usually a bit of downtime when you don't have the status applied, and some bosses like Elden Beast and Mog are immune to such statuses. Otherwise, they would easily be S tiered. In PvP, I rated them with the assumption of no self-application, which requires your opponent to give you a chance to freely apply Sapuku or the Poison Pot. Furthermore, boluses are there to mitigate buildup. It can often be the status or the weapon itself that's really doing the job, rather than the talisman's boosts. It doesn't really matter if you're getting a 20% damage boost after the first attack, if your first attack already took over half the enemy's HP. Honestly, you can easily say these are A-tiered talismans and I would agree with you. The status effect prevention talismans can't be hard swapped on. Well, they can, but it takes time for the status to decay away, so you kind of need to have them already equipped. Because they are very specific, I don't particularly think they're that great. They are boluses or flame cleanse me. You can also avoid status puddles with stuff like bloodhound step. More importantly, they're very situational which drops their rating. They definitely work when they work, but in general I wouldn't have them equipped. I basically just toss them into the same tier. For PvP, they're in different tiers because code and bleed are more common. As for the talisman that gives focus, immunity, and robustness, it also ranks higher because it gives you more total resistance, while helping preventing against other status effects like sleep, madness, poison, and scarlet rot. I did the math for equip low talisman in part 1 of my video, 
It shows that these talismans give a ton of endurance worth of equip load. They're easily still B-tiered in PvE for helping save attributes while wearing heavier armor. As for PvP, they're definitely both A-tier staples for meta level as they are the best way to stretch into more points, allowing you to invest more into vigor or your offensive stat while reaching heavier equip loads with a reasonable amount of endurance to get the much needed poise. HP talismans are great, especially because Vigor caps quite hard at 60. Starting with a Crimson Amber Medallion, I've placed it in C tier for PvE because while it serves to make you tankier, it's comparatively worse than your other options later. For example, the Crimson C Talisman coming up next easily helps you with more HP sustain. For duels though, which I've labeled with a D here, this is easily one of the best talismans when HP flasks are unavailable to you by dueling etiquette. The Crimson Sea Talisman is excellent at keeping you alive, with the only caveat being you have to have lost enough HP for the extra health to matter. Sometimes the boss can kill you if you don't heal early enough, and then this talisman won't come into play. Thus, it receives a B. For PvP, I've labeled this I for invasions since you don't drink flasks for duels. Despite the lower flask count, this talisman can provide much needed sustain, especially when alternatives like Dragon Crest Great Shield are nerfed for PvP. I've played the Blessed Dew at C tier because this talisman's effectiveness is largely dependent on how much time the fight goes on for. Most of the time, it isn't that great in actual fights, but it can help you greatly as an AFK tool in PvE exploration or do decent in PvP invasions when you're running away. The Ritual Talismans are hard to maintain in PvP. In fact, it's very easy for an opponent to lead with a consumable to take away the effect. But if they don't do that, then they can provide decent value and be an option to hard swap off of. Overall, not that good. They work much better in PvE as you can maintain 100% more easily. I've rated the sword above the shield for PvE because it is easier to create a strategy to stay at 100% health to do more damage rather than making use of the damage reduction from the shield talisman to heal immediately back up to 100% health. Sometimes you just get hit by a weak attack and don't really need the pot. The feather branches are rated lower for PvE in general because you typically don't want to stay at low health where you can get one-shotted unless you're doing a no-hit. For PvP, I've talked about using both of these talismans together. They can really help you deal with the final pokes to whittle you down and give you a chance at a comeback assuming you don't get directly killed from above 20% health. I added the plus symbol here to show that I think you should be running them together or just choose something else. For the FP talismans, max FP and mine are better at helping you get more use out of your FP flask for more overall sustain in PvE. For PvP, FP is typically not your issue and investing in mind while slotting Crimson Amber is always better at sensible levels of vigor and mind. Therefore, Cerulean Amber is ranked lower, as it makes more sense to just invest in mind. As for the Cerulean Seed, same reason. You don't really need the additional FP from the flask for the most part. By the time the extra FP makes a difference, you have more than enough FP already. The Ancestral Horn is F in PvP because it's kill-based. It does okay in PvE if your build is FP efficient, but it's just easier to use the Cerulean Ember Medallion that also works for bosses. As for the Villagree Crest, I've rated it higher than the Medallion because it is easily possible to save more FP if your entire build is based on weapon arts. Also, remember, the list is made for around 125 to 150. So at this point, I expect most people's FP issue to be a bit alleviated. This is a much stronger talisman at lower levels when FP is still an issue. Shard of Alexander, easily highest tier with how good and efficient weapon arts are. There is a reason why people spam weapon arts. You can easily get high activation uptime with the Shard of Alexander. The Roar Medallion is pretty much only for Roar attacks, so it receives a much lower rating of C. I've discussed how stamina regeneration can often be more beneficial for combat in part 1. I don't really see myself needing that extra max stamina, especially if you can manage stamina decently well. Turtle Talisman on the other hand is much better for combat on stamina heavy specs in my opinion. Blue Dancer? In PvP, optimized builds are never that light. In PvE, you can get value for staying light and not getting hit, but overall still not that great. It barely gets pushed to a D. The Rotten Wing Sword can stack really high amounts of percent multiplier for PvE, but it takes time to start stacking first so I gave it a B 
In PvP, you need to land multiple attacks in succession. So while it can give a good multiplier, you're unlikely to get or maintain it. This is the same for Luminescent's prosthesis that gives slightly less percent multiplier in exchange for 5 dexterity. This exchange favors it for PvP, where successive attacks are hard to land. Next, the Swaddling Cloth provides sustain. The condition is also hard to pull off for PvP. As for the Taker's cameo, it's kill based, so easy F for PvP. While I'd say in PvE, by the time you're getting this talisman, it's not that great anymore since you probably struggle more against bosses and not general exploration where there are many more kills for you to land. The Drake talismans are very situational, so they lose points there. But if you're struggling against a particular region or boss, these are good defensive options for PvE. For PvP, you would need a slot ahead of time to swap into one of these talismans and you would need to know your opponent's build. In that sense, you can actually say the Spelldrake Talisman is better than the rest, because it is easiest to spot a mage that'll be doing pure magic damage. I toss them together because I highly doubt anyone would actually swap into these things, when you can just start with Crimson Amber. The Pearl Drake Talisman gives you overall negation for non-physical damage, which I think is weaker than the other Drake Talismans in PvE, because you don't often find multiple damage types per region, and it only reduces by 9% instead of 20%. In PvP, I label this eye for invasions since I would only consider the extra negation for making myself tankier alongside Flask. Overall, still not that great. The Heirloom Talismans aren't actually that bad, especially in a stat-hungry build, at least at level 125. For the math, check out part 1 once again. But factoring in a bit of extra stats from leveling up too, I place them comfortably at C tier for level 125. Notice. Heirlooms rank better than the Cerulean Ember Medallion, as the Cerulean doesn't give you more than 5 stat points at these levels of mind. They rank the same as the Crimson Ember in PvE, only because they are better defensive alternatives to the Crimson Ember. This also means the Sorcios must rank lower at this level, especially when flasks are considered. For the PvP side, I label them with D for duels, since in invasions, they would essentially lower your flask effectiveness because of lowered negation. The Radagons ranks higher than the Americas because it is way easier to get the full 20 point value out of Radagons than Americas. Also, I made a small mistake while changing my example for Sorcios. I forgot to do the negation calculation multiplicatively. Here is the fixed calculation. You see the Sorcio beating the Heirloom Talisman by a slight amount. However, remember, this is a heavily skewed test in favor of the source seal by pretending your vigor would be that low. In actual practice, the heirloom talismans will still outperform the source seals, even after factoring the bonus from extra levels that the source seals give you, which happens to be not much at such a high level. The scorpion charms are A tier in PvE. Their PvP nerf hits them hard enough that I would say just don't use them. Okay. Why is the 12% bonus with a 10% reduction in negation A tier in PvE? The thing is, unlike something like the Graven Mass Talisman or the Bow Charms, there is more than one source of magic damage. For example, if you're using a Magic Scorpion Charm, and you're using a Magic Infused Weapon or Weapon Art, they will also get the bonus in addition to your spells. Therefore, these talismans are more widely applicable. Plus. The downside can be easily offset by another strong talisman pick, the Dragon Crest Great Shield. I've already said this one is great in part 1. When the majority of the damage you're taking is physical damage in this game, this reduces all physical damage taken by a whole 20%. It prevents damage taken before it happens, which is more valuable than attempting to find the right time to heal back the damage you took. But for PvP, it suffers from the same issues as the Drake Talisman, being greatly nerfed. So yeah, this is the complete tier list. Now let us touch upon some extra caveats and then do some double checking. First, let's talk about hard swaps. These are some generally hard swappable talismans both on and off. The ritual talismans are obvious. They do nothing after your HP drops below 100%. Removing the Crimson Amber Medallion will only lower max HP. Elden Ring doesn't scale your HP down using your current HP versus maximum HP. This also means that a talisman like the Primal Glintstone Blade, which is not worth it due to the minus 15% max HP cost, can be slotted in for a null detriment after your HP drops 15% under max HP. 
So obviously, it becomes much better on the tier list if you build around swapping into the Tasman, especially as a pure sorcerer. As for levels, if your level is slower than what this tier list is made for, talismans like the Heirloom and Sword Seals obviously turn better when you have less total stat points, while talismans like the Crimson Amber turn worse because you haven't reached the Vigor cap. As previously mentioned, something like the Filigree Crest or Cerulean Amber Medallion also becomes a lot better. If your level is higher, like playing at level 713, then a lot of these talismans become quite useless, like the stat talismans or even the great jars if you have more than enough equip load. Remember, this tier list is centered around 125 to 150 range, and even then, the heirlooms are already worse off at 150 than 125, so keep in mind the effects of levels. Now let's double check if the tier list checks out and look at the values I'm assigning each tier. First up, these are the talismans with nerf percents for PvP. You will notice, they are almost always lower on PvP tier than the PvE tier, which makes sense. The only exception is the Pearl Drake talisman. Why is this the case? Well, in PvE, there exists the alternative of slotting one of the other Drake talismans. Because the zone usually only has one elemental damage type, the Pearl Drake isn't as great of a choice. Furthermore, in PvP, especially in invasions as I labeled it, you are more likely to meet multiple elemental types. In addition to that, it is the least nerfed talisman on the list, getting nerfed from 9% to 4% in PvP, as opposed to something like the Dragon Crest Gratio, that got nerfed from 20% to 5% in PvP. Next, remember one of the criteria is universality. The Drake talismans suffer from this, hence are rated lower than the Dragon Crest Gratio even though in terms of effectiveness, they're both 20% negation when meeting the right target. This is because Dragon Crest reduces all four types of physical damage, which is also more prevalent overall than spell damage. This obviously applies to other talismans like the Hammer Talisman, as previously discussed. It works well against what it is intended against, but those targets are few and can also be dealt with in other ways. As for the Scorpion Charm, it got nerfed to the point where you might as well not wear the talisman in PvP, and its best combo, the Dragon Crest, is also nerfed. So it is not surprising it fell from S in PvE to F in PvP. As for the relative values I assigned for each category, each letter grade is worth about this much. There are some more obvious examples within the list. For example, if you play pure sorcery or incantation, the spell talismans give you an 8% and 4% buff respectively. You can quite easily see this fit into the values I assigned. On the other hand, we have talismans that are harder to keep full of time. These are also scaled down accordingly. A more obvious question you might have is, why is the Crimson Amber labeled A tier, when A tiers are labeled over 9% in effectiveness? Isn't 8% HP just 8% effectiveness? Well you're right, but it is the lightest talisman on this tier list, able to save you one point of endurance oftentimes. If you have the extra weight to spare, it is also the easiest talisman to hard swap off from. To add on to this, since we're not really considering hard swap, you are looking at one of the most universally usable talismans, able to add 8% max HP to any build, which is very valuable because of the 60 vigor soft cap. Due to HP being harder to acquire after 60 vigor, this talisman is worth relatively way more vigor points than it suggests since it is one of the best ways to get more HP. Remember, these values are tools to help you classify most talismans. They are not always strict or obvious as you have to consider alternatives while keeping in mind the assumptions. And finally, why is the Millicent's Prosthesis the same level as an Heirloom Talisman? That is because it requires one more endurance in terms of weight for an effect that won't activate if you don't build for it. And even if you do, the conditions are hard to activate. Anyway, I think I explained my reasoning pretty clearly, but this is a big list. Let me emphasize this. Check the pinned comment, as I will add additional notes. I know it's hard for people to completely agree, and there will likely be disputes. As long as you give me detailed reasoning in the comments down below, if you can show me something I didn't already consider within the tier list, some of which I didn't present but already considered, then I am very willing to shift the rating around. But here it is again, my version of the talisman tier list. If you like this type of analytical content, I have a discord if you want to find me. Like and subscribe, Krite, signing out.